I were gonna describe the plot of Repo Man, I would have to say that it's punk rock meets science fiction in Ronald Reagan's house. I was around before Repo Man uh, came into play, actually. Uh, I had co-written a script with a friend of mine, a 17-page short called Leather Rubbernecks. And uh, Alex Cox had decided that he was going to try and get some grant money to produce and direct our script. When that fell through, eventually, he incorporated that into what would become Repo Man. So the year was 1982. I had got my graduation picture taken. 1982, The Problem Is You is what I had dubbed that year. Uh, I was probably among four other punk rockers in my school at the time. And I had shaved my head and taken my yearbook picture in this cap and gown. And I gave this picture to Alex, and he put it on his typewriter right in front of the keys and commenced to write what became Repo Man. At that point in time, I was a member of a band called The Circle Jerks. We were one of Alex Cox's favorite bands. Alex Cox had a tendency to have all of his favorite bands or some of the bands that he was listening to at the time, at the moment, be a part of, uh, if they weren't part of the movie, they would be part of the soundtrack. The way that Alex represented the punk kids in Repo Man, it was exactly the way that it went down. And you have to understand how big of a deal the music was, what an influence it was on Alex and everyone creating the film. You know, the funny thing about the 80s was that there were a lot of films that were trying to portray what punk rock was, or they would have a punk rock character in it. But having been a part of it, it always seemed like somebody that just walked out of wardrobe and, you know, had the fake mohawk on or whatever it was. You didn't really get the feeling of what it was like, you know? It was always some sort of portrayal that you would expect out of uh, the news, you know? They, the, the media would want you to see something in a certain way to, to create some sort of fear in you. And, you know, what, what we did was not that at all. It was an, an embrace of what that culture was. And it was punk rock. It was, like, authentic. One thing I hated was when you saw a movie about rock and roll or music, and it was so cheesy, you know what I mean? And Alex was the real deal. This film, the soundtrack, everything, is really close to my heart because of being part of that scene, of that punk scene. It's the first and only film or acting project that I've ever been involved in that actually brought the music and the film world together authentically. How I first got turned on to Repo Man was the role of Debbie. That's who I originally auditioned for because I was a punk rocker in real life. They screen tested me that day. Alex was shooting and I read with Dick Rude playing the role of Otto. I don't know if they knew they had Emilio yet, but um, so I read with Dick Rude and then Alex said, would you do me a favor and take a look at this other character? And originally, Layla was supposed to be a woman in her late 40s that, he, that Otto had an affair with an older woman. That was the character. And he, he said, I know it's the wrong age, but just do it like you would do it. And, and then there was a scene with, that I did with Dick. And I remember I bit his hand in the scene, like in the like audition, and I knew I got it when I did it. I was like... As we had people come in and read, you know, I was always reading the role of Otto, and I was certain that, of course, I was going to play the role of Otto. And one day, Emilio came in, and I didn't know who Emilio was. I, did, I think at that time, he had done one lead role. I think the film was Tex or something. I had no idea who he was or who his family were or, you know, where he came from. Uh, and I thought he might have been good for the role of Duke. <laughs> uh, I had no idea that the, that money was sort of working against my design at that point. Um, and when I found out, I think I was probably, you know, pretty uh, miffed. And But at the same time, I, I recognized that that's what needed to be done to make the film 
fly and what was going to get at distribution at the end of the day. I came in to audition for one of the Rodriguez brothers, obviously since my last name is Sandoval and my first name is Miguel, that seemed somewhat logical. So I came in, you know, sat in the waiting room, went downstairs in the, uh, in the garage where the auditions were being held in, on, in Santa Monica on Main Street. And I just started in, literally said two or three words in the audition. And, and I, there was sitting Vicky Thomas, the casting director, and this tall, lanky English guy who presumably was the director. And I just started in, I just said a couple of words. He went, no, 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 no. Excuse me? He says, no, no, no. I said, sorry. He said, you're not at all right for this part. I went, great, thanks. I'm so glad I wasted my time coming down here to audition for this. He said, can you talk like this? I said, excuse me? He said, can you talk like this? I said, yeah, I can talk like this. He says, great. He said, follow me. And we went around the corner and there was the Malibu. And he said, can you leap up on the hood of that car with one movement? I said, well, maybe not from a standing position, but I could try. Very strange. And, and so I took a couple steps back, and I left up on the hood of the car. He said, great. I got good news for you, and I got bad news. Well, the bad news is you're going to be in Repo Man as Archie the Mohawked Kid. And I went, OK, well, what's the good news? He says, the good news is you get to have a mohawk. And that's how I got the part. <laughs> Take a look at this. <laughs> looks, like, looks like sausage. This is sausage, Otto. That's a picture of four dead aliens. <laughs> I got to do total UFO research. I, Alex was sending me to conventions, to UFO conventions at like the Marriott Hotel. It was so bizarre. And I was 18 years old. Like it was, I think I was 17 actually when we started and I turned 18. I was a kid, you know, and I, and I was very vulnerable and very gullible, but that's, and Layla was that girl. And I went to the, and I, I was getting into it. Like I, 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 it was scary at one point. I remember going to this one convention. I mean, these people were really bizarre. I was 30 years old. I was not part of the punk, you know, scene or ethos at all. I mean, I didn't know anything about it. And I tried to educate myself what environment, what world my character came out of. My wife saw an artist who had uh, just a strip, a mustache kind of displaced on the side of his cheek. And I thought, ooh, that's a nice touch. I don't know if it's punky or not, but I didn't want to, you know, just be like, eh, I'm a punk. No, no, that didn't work. Alex also had the cast rehearsing. We didn't really have a budget to do that kind of thing. It was unusual that a film of that budget would have rehearsals, but he kind of did it. We were doing it and not really getting paid. We just wanted to make it the best. So he would have Emilio and I rehearse at Emilio's apartment, do our scenes together, and just, just like be together as much as we could, you know, method. He wanted to have that chemistry. The scene with me and Emilio, you know, in the UF, at the UFO, the United Fruit Cake outlet, and he comes to, you know, he wants to get the blow job. I slap him, and I slapped him again, that it wasn't in the script. I'm at work, Otto. Oh yeah, me too. Your work is different than mine. Says who? What are you doing? Don't do that! The least you could do is give me a blowjob. And Alec, but Alex whispered to me, he goes, do something, to, like, just keep going and just don't let him know what you're gonna do. And that's why he cracked up. He left it in because he had no idea it was gonna hit him again. Lila, we have a cell meeting in two minutes' time. Thanks, Deirdre, I'll be right there. <laughs> another favorite scene and another great example of, of Alex, uh, you know, succumbing to actors' impulses and ideas was when Duke, Debbie, and Archie uh, robbed the liquor store. Archie. They all ran away. 
So, of course, putting on the paper bag over your head with the eyes cut out and the mohawk cut out, you could not see anything. So when we, the three of us, after we finished the scene, exited the liquor store in haste, um, Archie runs into a cement pole that is right out, that is a parking guard, right outside, just, and it's the perfect height that, boom, right in, into old Scooter and the boys, you know, bam. Come on, you douchebag. The, the, the bar scene was filmed um, down on Sunset Boulevard in Silver Lake next to uh, a, a popular club called The On Club. And the room that they filmed it in was just a scuzzy bar that uh, I, I don't think any of us had ever been to. We shot it in Silver Lake at a club called The Cave, which was this really cool club that looked like a cave. I got to bring my friends down to the set, and um, and I and I was I my friends were characters because I was in that scene, that Hollywood punk scene. One of my friends is a drag queen in there, Maynard Maynard Monroe, who's dressed in like feathers and fabulous. And I brought Rodney Bingenheimer from K Rock, Rodney on the Rock. He was one of my best friends because I was playing music, and that's how we had met. And he was the club owner. He was the manager of the club with his little bow tie. We were told to be there at 11 in the morning. We showed up at 11 in the morning. In the mid, uh, uh, they, they obviously um, were trying to torture us, knowing that we're these guys in this band that stay up till four or five in the morning doing drugs, drinking, trying to find the next party. Now, our fitting wasn't your typical, um, well, that sweater looks really good on you, so that's what you'll wear. But we'll, we'll have you take it off and we'll have you uh, put it back on later on, like 15, 20 minutes, half an hour before you're being filmed. Our fitting was that the four of us were going to be wearing colorful tuxedos in a bar scene. Do -do -do -wop -wop, say what? Yeah. We met Xander Schloss, who would later become the bass player in the Circle Jerks, that day that we were being fitted, and we were all grumpy and grouchy and hungover and wanting to find the drug dealer. And we weren't very nice to him. When Chris Penn was originally cast as Kevin, and he actually shot for a couple of days, and he was like, oh, he had a problem with the wardrobe it was weird, and he didn't want to wear hats or something. I don't know. And Xander was our PA, and he was picking cigarette butts. I remember he had one of those pokem sticks, and he was picking cigarette butts off the parking lot. And he, because he fit in Chris Penn's wardrobe, he went and they put him right on set, and he went in. That was it. That was the first time he ever acted, and he was so amazing. There's fucking room to move as a fry cook, man. You know, I could be manager in two years. King. God. The soundtrack was released on MCA prior to the release of the film and started selling like crazy. And I think the studio at the time was having issues internally and the new heads weren't interested in releasing Repo Man because they didn't understand it and it was too punk rock for them. And they didn't want to be attached to the old regime's product. and. MCA was the parent company at that time and called up and said, hey, what's going on? We're selling these records like crazy. You guys have to release this film. When you look at the album cover and you see Emilio Estevez, you're, you're, you're looking at this guy and kind of rubbing your chin or scratching your head or wondering, this guy looks pretty cool. This looks punk rock. Oh, let's look at the let's look at the back of the album cover, and then all of a sudden you see all of these bands, and a lot of the bands um, were fairly popular bands. Now, granted, we're all underground, but that was the beauty of all of this. You know, it really did give us the the balls to drive it in the direction that we wanted to go in and say, we don't care, you know. Iggy is gold. 
if you have Iggy on your team, you're blessed. Keith Morris, the Circle Jerks, Black Flag, all of that music that was pumping out of LA at that time, that couldn't really make it out into the hinterlands of the US, suddenly had a vehicle in the soundtrack of Repo Man. And kids sitting in their little garages out in Ohio were going, whoa, this is cool, you know? And it wasn't the Sex Pistols where there was this stigma attached to it or that it was 6,000 miles away and that's what they were doing there. This was right here at home. Suddenly, hey, we're doing this here. And everybody my age at that time suddenly had something in their ears to hear that they had never heard before. The Circle Jerks track that was recorded for the soundtrack was um, probably one of our most ironic moments because the lineup of the band at that time, it was the only thing that we recorded with the guys who were in the band at that time. And we had probably one of the greatest drummers of all time playing drums with us at the time. And that would be Chuck Biscuits. Chuck had played with DOA, he'd play with Black Flag. Um, he ended up playing in Social Distortion. He played with Glenn Danzig. He played in the Circle Jerks. And um, the track that we recorded was Earl Liberty, Chuck Biscuits, and Greg Hetson all playing acoustic guitars to a drum machine. So an extraordinary event for me in the making of Repo Man was being able to be in the recording studio when Iggy recorded the title track. So imagine you're a 17-year-old kid and here's your punk rock idol recording a song for a film that you helped write and starred in and just being to getting to be like practically the only audience in the room when him and Steve Jones and all these other great guys at the time are in the studio. Uh, that to me was extremely exciting. And I actually have a cassette tape of the session where uh, Iggy was riffing and just trying to figure out what some of the lyrics were and sings, Dick Rude is a repo man. And I thought, that's it, I've, you know, I've arrived. Iggy just sang about me. I was wearing a nice black and white knit sweater that my mom had made for me. I think he started singing about that as well. So Repo Man is almost 29 years old and I saw the film a few years back in the theater and it occurred to me that, damn, this film has legs. If I had never made another film, if I'd never been a part of another film, this one's gonna stay around forever, you know? It's always gonna be on TV. It's always gonna be remembered. And what a gift to be a part of something cool and hip and indelible. Wow, this is intense. Life with Repo Man is always intense. And you got Robbie Mueller, you got Iggy Pop. What the fuck? You got Dick Rude? You got a hit. In a sluggish economy, inflation and recession hits the land of the free. Standing unemployment lines, blame the government for hard times. We just get by however we can. We all got a duck when the shit hits the fan.